Okay, so if I launch Mac Biophotonics, so when you unzip it, you just get them on the desktop. So here we are, here's the Mac Biophotonics. And this is what I was saying about the plugins getting nicely ordered by doing it. So under the plugins list, there are all the goodies that you get preloaded with the MBF section. And they're all pre-ordered and nicely arranged. If you just downloaded the basic version from the MBF, uh, from the ImageJ website, they basically stop at this line here. So all these you would have to download yourself. So there's um, stacks, time lapse, Z stacks, segmentation, region of interest analysis, all of the things that we're going to do um, later on. And you've got these little shortcut keys at the top, and you can choose what you do regularly. You know, so. Um, if you do a lot of color combining, stack tools, if you need to reorder them. So it's not just the basic, that's it. And you can actually load your own interest groups. So that's image J. If we down open Fiji, it looks pretty similar because it is, essentially. It's the same, same core software. But you've got different plugins. You know, so that's why we use both, because sometimes the MBF has the useful plugins. Sometimes it's easier and quicker to go through Fiji rather than going back to the plugins list, downloading it and putting it into ImageJ. Why not just use them both kind of um, side by side? And the good thing is you get lots and lots of sample images to play with. So the first one that I always open is, is fluorescent cells because it kind of looks as close um, as anything that we have downstairs. And it started doing this, that you basically end up with this channel tool at the bottom. And image J, it doesn't matter if you're looking at channels or time or Z, they pretty much all go along this bottom taskbar. So if you wanted to play through Z, you would still play this same slidey bar at the bottom. And you kind of think, I've got three images here but they all look exactly the same, right? But up here, it's saying, actually, there's three channels to this image. It was a red, green, blue. What we can do is we can go in and using the brightness contrast tool, you can actually see the histogram for the blue channel. So as I was saying earlier, everything you do is all about histograms, your data range. So if we go through, there's the histogram for the green. There's the histogram for the red. We can do it, even though we're looking at a three color image, we can go in and play with each channel independently and see what's happening to the overall image as we're doing it. Woo, and go like that. Okay, so that's how you play with the data. Watch up here. So as we're moving about, we can see our XY position of our pixel plus the value, and that's the value in the green channel. Change to the, the blue, that's now the values in the blue channel. And so you can go through. One thing you've got to be careful about, if you say apply, that's going to change the true data. So at the minute, we're looking at what was the acquired data. If I press apply now, rather than being uh, 0 to 255 and 98 there, that will become 256. I'm in the wrong channel. Why is it not coming up? And your data actually gets overwritten. Although it doesn't seem to be doing it in this case. Try it later on. But if you press apply, you change the raw data. Okay? So you can tweak it but your data will then still be the same, whatever you do. Even though it looks nicer, when you're doing the numbers, the numbers will still come out as true. But that's not that useful. It's hard to see what's going on on top of each other. But if you press this button here, it turns it into an RGB document. So you've no longer got that slidey bar along the bottom. But if you press it again, it will split it up into the individual channels. Yeah? So you can see each channel. I and mean, you could, if you wanted, work on each one of those 
independently so you can see the raw channel on its own. You've not got this problem that you're kind of looking at the red, green and blue simultaneously. And if you want to put those channels back together again then, you can just go in and say, well, my red channels, are, I want to look red, my green, I want to look green. I don't want a blue one anymore. I don't want a grey one anymore. Okay, that. And now I've just got my red and green channels. Yeah, so it's, it's easy to do. Another thing that I, I, I love about uh, ImageJ is there's, there's tools to kind of help you. So if we open that same sample image, often you want to kind of show that as a, as a montage. So there's a really quick shortcut key, color functions, um, RGB to montage. First of all, we're going to make it an RGB. And then plugins, color functions, RGB to montage. And we can choose how we want to have that displayed. Nice horizontal, down a vertical or in a square. Um, how would you like it to be displayed? Black and white, black and white, black and white color, red, green, blue, or for colorblind people. So the options are, are there. So if we go with grays, no scale bar a nice little border in between each one, save you having to nudge it around in PowerPoint and align, align, align. Okay, that, and straight away, it's made a montage for you. Okay, so, you go, ah. all you have to do then <laughs> is save that as a TIFF. Okay, you want to be careful about saving things. Don't start thinking, oh, I'll save space, I'll save it as a JPEG. Okay, JPEG is a lossy compression format. So your data is going to start disappearing. Every time you open a JPEG and then resave it, it gets worse and worse and worse. Okay, so save it as TIFF or a raw file. So you can then save them as whatever you want, and then you can open them in PowerPoint, and at least they're already um, put together. Uh huh. So when you, you've adjusted the brightness contrast, yeah. and then when you make the montage, it goes back to the unmodified setting. Hmm. Uh, I'll have a look at that. It might be that you do need to apply that setting for the, you know, to show the images, otherwise it's gonna go back to the raw data. But all the time you ever do any image Processing. If you're going to compare two images that you acquired, your your control and your your experimental, you know, you can do anything you want to them to make them look the same if you wanted, or adjust them to make them look different. Your data analysis would be best done on the raw figures, not kind of the montage of it or anything like that. That's kind of your your endpoint looky see. Um, but yeah, your numbers would always be the same regardless of what the image looked like, unless you applied it, because that would then save the, the different display. Um, another thing that people always want to do is scale bars and measurements. So if we go to our Im bioimaging website, the pixel calibration for all of the microscopes is actually online. So the snapshot microscopes, it will tell you what calibration you need using the times 20 on Ernst or, or the times 60 on Ludwig or anything like that. Because you can see here, it tells you that it was a 512, 512 image. It's a red, green, blue document, and it's one meg. It doesn't say anything about calibration. So it's an uncalibrated image. But what we can do is we can actually go in and set a scale. And this is the bit that's on our website. So we can say, well, we know one pixel corresponds to 0.17 UM for microns, and okay that. And now you can see that that's now different. That's now saying this image is 87 by 87 microns, which is a 512, 512 image, um, and nothing else is different. Now, if we went and got the line tool, and we measured that length up at the top in the taskbar is the actual length in microns. So if you were doing that, lengths, measurements, areas, 
it would all be in microns now, not pixels. So if you don't set a scale, all of your values are kind of meaningless because it's just going to be a pixel value, not a, not a true area. And if you wanted to know that, you could even go under Analyze and measure. And there you go. So you can kind of whoops, keep drawing lines. New line there, Analyze, Measure. And it just add, keeps adding it. OK, so you do it that way. But you want to add a scale bar. So now we've got a scale. All we have to do is go under Tools, Scale Bar, or alternatively have it there. You know, shortcut for scale bar. And what do you want? Well, I'd like a 20 micron scale bar. Where do you want it? How big should it be? Um, 10 microns down at the bottom. Nah, I can't see it. Upper right. Would you like it with the text? Nah. You know, there you go. What color? Yellow. It's as simple as that. So you know that scale's right. The one thing you have to be careful of is image J doesn't work in layers that would then get stamped into your image. So if we were happy with that, and then we went and split that image, what you end up with is that scale bar in your red and green, because it wanted it to make yellow, but not in your blue. You know, So don't add the scale bars until you want it. You could have added it um, to, the, to the montage at the end, because your pixel sizes are the same. Even though it's a montage of three or four images, your pixel calibration is still right. So you could have added the scale bar at the end point of that and just put it in one image down in the bottom corner. Yeah. So I cover that in one of my other not to be missed YouTube videos if you if you uh, wanna wanna watch that. Yeah, absolutely. You can save it as anything you want. As soon as you Absolutely. Absolutely. So th that's one of the things we say is, if you're going to add scale bars, just save it as plus scale. And like you say, there's no problem there. The only other way of getting rid of that scale bar is to crop out your image. Yep. All of them. Yeah. Really? OK. So if we went to fluorescent cells, and we made that an RGB, and we duplicate that image. So image duplicate. There we go. There's another one. So we want to set the scale. Um, image. Where have you gone? Analyze. Set scale. One is not point one seven. One seven um. Okay, so that's right. I didn't press global. <laughs> there we go. OK. So it set that one already as well. So if we opened um, another one, disable global calibration? No, I want that. You can see that's now got the same. Oh, your scale bars you'd have to add separately, but the calibration carries. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because if you if you crop that image, you're not really changing the pixels. Calibration, you're just making fewer of them. Um, so, your pixel now you've got a smaller area, but the pixel calibration is, is still, the, still the same. Uh, so, that's, that's how you can crop that easy. You know, image, crop. If you crop in a circle, it's obviously going to make it a square. Unless you went to image, um, and you can then do mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, clear outside. Boom. You know, there's whatever you want to ever do. Yeah, question at the back? To specify? 
a region of interest? Absolutely. So if you go to this tool, it's one of the plugins, ROI, specify ROI. So it, you want it to be 300 by 300? Um, okay. Why is that not? Hmm, saying that should work. Specify ROI. Oh, oh, ROI in microns, no. <laughs> Let's do it in pixels. 500 to 300 by 300. There you go. Pardon? Yeah. Here. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. That, that. Here. This one. This one. Ah. Hmm. Don't know. That's right. Okay. So that you know, once you've got this, you can you can move your ROI wherever you want. So that's kind of the basic features of image J. You know, the very, very basic things of opening an image, adding a scale bar, adjusting the brightness contrast for each image, making a figure legend. That's it. You know, okay, so zip along through that. The beauty of image J is it can handle pretty much any image type. You know, if people say, oh, I use Adobe Photoshop and things like that. Well, that only works on photos really well. ImageJ knows it's all for data and data sets and image sequences, things like that. So you can just basically drag files onto the desktop, on, onto the ImageJ um, taskbar. And if it recognizes them, it'll just open them. So if we have a look at a Leica Confocal stack, which is a LIF file. So if you try to open this in anything other than the Leica software normally, it just it spits out its dummy. But you drag it onto the ImageJ website, it goes, ah, oh, I can recognize this. And using a special bioformats importer reader, it can actually look inside that big data set and show you all of the individual data sets. So what would you like to do? Um, RGB colorize, split the channels. OK, so in here. It can show you what files are present with inside that big lift. And the first one is normally already ticked. So this has got um, 512, 512 image, 138 planes, which are two channels. Okay. Or there's that one, 53 channels, or that one. Um, so you're happy, tick the one you want to open. Just open one at a time, otherwise you're going to run out of space. And okay. Boom. There we go. So I better change the. And here we are. Now we're working in Z, even though it's still this slidey bar at the bottom. So we're now going up and down through Z. Here's the red channel. Yeah. So you can see that. Make it brighter. So there's your two individual channels, which mo normally you'd want to combine them together. Simple. You just press your red, green, blue merge split tool and say which one's which. So this is my red channel. That's my green channel. Create composite. That's quite useful. OK, I'll show you that in a second. Combine it together. Now we've put that Z stack together. Yeah. Um, let's crop that off a bit. There we go. Okay, so there's your there's your Z stack, and you've got that again. You know that channel tool, red and green. Being in a composite, you get a, a really nice feature, which is is something that you use a lot in um, Adobe Photoshop, which is where you can toggle a channel. So you can see the red on its own, and then the green, or the green on its own. 
Yep. You don't get this bar? No. The Z bar? You only see a single image? I would try reloading MBF if it's not reading the stack as a stack. Ah, you mean it might be the option the options that you have where you have like the big window of yeah. how to open it and things like that. If you don't say open entire stack, maybe it'll just somewhere you might just say open first Z or something like that. So this is one of the things where you have to spend part of that week doing nothing apart from playing an image J, just deciding how you want it to open. Do you want them to open up as an RGB merge stack, or do you want to open them up as red and green separately? Do you want to open them up as pseudo colored? Would you rather it be black and white? It goes on and on and on. But yeah, you've just got to kind of bang your head against the wall, and then eventually remember what buttons you pressed in what order to get what you wanted, and then then write it down. <laughs> or, or you download one of these desktop recorders so that when you actually do it, you can go back and see what buttons you pressed in what order to, um, to do it. But this is, this is one of the nice features. So under the image color, you've got those split channel, merge channel, which is what that, that little button does. Ooh, that doesn't look good. And we have channel tools. And this is where we can toggle the channels. Yeah. Ah, all of a sudden it's like working in Adobe Photoshop. <laughs> you can't do that if it's an RGB document. It only works when it's this composite, which is where it's sort of like layers. But it's really nice. So now you can play up through your, your Z stack. Ah, I see what's going on. Yeah. So once you're in your Z stack, you've got different tools that you can play with. So you can do all of the things again. You can set the scale if you want to. But what's good is ImageJ is designed to read data sets. So if you acquired it on a microscope that is able to save in the metadata, which is like a little header at the top of your file, all the things about that microscope. So it knows what objectives were used, what laser lines were used. What so it's able, if you see here, it's already read the scale. So we don't have to apply the scale in this case. If it comes up here and it's automatically read it, it's done. So you know it's right. Okay. So Z tools. Under stacks, you've got all of these different things. You can convert this stack into individual images if you wanted to fill your desktop with images. Or likewise, if you wanted to um, you open a series of images and you wanted to make it into a little movie stack, which is quite useful. It's possible to do it that way around. You can re-slice it to cut through the image in different ways. So if we take this tool and we say, oh, let's have a look through there. Image, stacks, re-slice. That's what it looks like if we cut that like a pie straight through there. Okay. It's also possible to do orthogonal views um, okay that's got to work in RGB color type let's make it let's do that um, no uh, I'm gonna kill it um, that only works in uh oh let's start let's restart image J And uh, task be gone. In a roundabout way, yes, it can do. It's quite quite roundabout. No. Yeah. Super. Thank you. All spotted. Okay. So let's go back into Microsoft.
Oui. Yeah, okay, so um, if we are, no, 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 image J, native image J. So this is the point I think which you would probably have um, an issue about opening all individual channels. Hmm, I'm not sure. But th here you can say, show me the metadata. Let's see what, what files were saved with my confocal stack. And we'll open that one again. Here we go. Here's all the information about how that image was taken. So this is like the Leica confocal setup. It's all there. So in there, it will tell you about the laser you used, the gain settings, all the things like that. So let's combine these two images together, but not make a composite. We're just going to make it a red, green, blue. So we lose that ability to toggle the channels on and off. But there we go. Crop that off. So let's make the red. Or oh, the other way you can do it, even in a red, green, blue. It's not quite the same, but we can um, tweak it. But it does it just for that image. Ah, pants in it. Anyhow, I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll you can see that. The point is, once we're in here, we actually get, under the Stacks tool, orthogonal views. So you can go in, and you can actually start to play with the data in XY, which you're all familiar with, or cutting it like a pie and looking at it side on in the XZ or the YZ angles. Yeah. So if you imagine we can go up and down through the sections that way, and the bottom one's going to change. Or we can cut the pie that way and look through it from one end to the other. Or you can have a look through the x, y, z angle. Yeah. And each of these, if you're happy with the image, you can just duplicate the one that you're highlighting. Image, duplicate. And you save that off as an individual that you can then just save as a TIFF. Yeah. So movies, if we close those. Okay, I'll come. I'll show you that one because this. Is, so this at the minute, we just play with the slidey bar. Under the image, stacks, tools, we've got animation options. Start animation, stop animation, animation options. So let's play this at. Um, I don't know, five. Now it's playing on its own, yeah, quite slowly. But you can go in and change how fast that's playing. If you wanted to, save as ABI. So you can just save off whatever you're doing, your Z stacks. Whoops, I just saved that as a BPM. Didn't I? save as an ABI. How fast do you want it to play? Well, let's do it 10 frames a second. Compression, uncompressed. Save it as that. Blah, 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 blah. There you go. An ABI that you can put in to your PowerPoint. Yeah, so it's it's all all doable. I mean, this is the, this is the beauty of, of image J. So the other thing that everyone seems to do on our confocals, they come and do a Z stack, and then they just want to squash it flat. Okay, so you know <laughs> you've got all of that Z information. They don't care about that. They just want to see a squashed flat, everything in focus, maximum intensity projection. So you've got these tools here. So you've got a shortcut key to maximum intensity projection, or under the image stacks um, Z project. And you can choose. I mean, this is where this software is better in a lot of ways than the Leica software because it's more flexible. So if you've got this big data set and we had 69 images in that, that stack and half of them were blur on either side of it, well, you don't want to use all of them. You could say, well, let's start at Z section 10 and finish at um, 50. 
and I would like to do the maximum intensity maximum intensity projection of that. Okay, that. But done. There's your image. That's still got the micron scale. So at this point here, you could add a scale bar. Where would you like it? Let's have a 50 micron scale bar. Save that as a TIFF. There's your figure. Yeah, it's really, really quite, quite quick. Um, yeah, so that's that's playing with Z stacks. The other thing you can do is, well, it's kind of hard to show a Z stack in a thesis. So one option would be save your AVI as a, a DVD at the back of your thesis, and maybe show representative images from the Z stack as a nice little montage. Okay, again, you're like, ooh, blimey, how would you? Sounds complicated. Actually, really easy. Under the stacks tool, you can make a montage. How would you like it to be displayed? How many columns? How many rows? Okay, so let's do five columns, four rows, starting at Z section six, finishing at 50. And this is where you've got to be good at maths because I have no idea how many images that would be. And I don't want to show every single image because not that much happens through a Z stack. Show me every sixth image. Okay, so it one misses it till the sixth, misses it till the whatever, 11th, is it, or something. Um, border width, would you like it to have a nice little gap between each one? Yes, please. Lab would you like them to be labeled so you know what Z section it is? Yeah, go on then. Okay, there you go. Almost impossible. My mental arithmetic's so poor that there you go. But the idea is, and the reason, why is it? not divided. I'm going to do that again. Did I keep it at zero? Uh, yep. Egypt. Great montage. Okay, every every three, four to it. Yeah, there we go. I don't like labeling slices. There you go. A nice one to stick into your, your report. Yeah. What I did there as well is scaled it. Um, make montage. So you can see that was scaled, so it was compressed down. So it all became quite pixelated. If we keep it at that. Yeah, I don't know if you can see. Looks, looks better, because we're not already compressing it down to make it a quarter of the size. We're just keeping it as the raw, raw size. Um, yeah, so it can do, the other thing it can do is resort things. So sometimes you end up, um, you, can con you can join movies together, you can add sections. So there's actually a way under the plugins um, where we can shuffle images. Stack sorter. So if you imagine, if you for some reason, that image there Let's make a hole in it, so it's pretty obvious. Okay, that image there was meant to be at the beginning, not there in the middle of the stack. We can highlight that, and we can say make that first. And now that's moved that image. You can't see that, can you? <laughs> that's now made that image right at the very beginning. Not, not towards the end. Or you could say, well, actually, no, that's my image. I don't want that. Let's move it a few frames in. <laughs> so about there. And now when we play our movie, there it is. Yeah, so you can actually play with the stacks because it doesn't, it doesn't care. You know, so you've got to be careful not to fiddle about too much and start moving things around. But you just control these uh, individual tips played as a series, like with your slidey bar. You can even say, well, actually, do you know what? I completely, something happened. The light came on. That image is terrible. I don't want that anymore. You can actually just delete that, um, that image. It's now just gone from your stack. So you've got to be careful. That's not the way of manipulating your data. <laughs> your and one thing to be careful about, actually, is um, being careful not to fiddle about too much. So you can see here. 
This is where we can choose with this pencil our background color. So you you'd be able to kind of say, oh, all right, okay, mm -hmm. let's let's make my my background nice and black. Uh, if I, I, ooh, there's a bit of debris there. I don't like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna delete that. And there's a bit of debris there. I'm gonna delete that. When you start to kind of play with a data set you can start to see what's going on you know because probably you had some background there it wasn't zero black is zero if you draw regions of interest and delete them to get rid of bits of speckles and things like that it's not right you know it's a point artifact there's ways you could kind of get around it crop it out of your image you know crop the image to get rid of the piece of debris just sort of using the paint tool or the delete tool is just a little bit a little bit um, bit naughty and the journals will pick up on it and you'll get ridiculed so <coughs> another t another thing that we we have quite a lot is live cell imaging on motorized XYZ stages and they don't always happen to be perfect repeat so when you watch the movie you might find whoop, whoop, whoop. It, it, it just moves a little bit and that's a real pain so there's a tool in the plugins called align so under the stack um, where are you T functions Uh, yeah, there we are. Align slices in stack. How do you want to do it? Yeah, there's a few different ones. Again, you'll have to have a play, decide which one works better, and you run it. And okay, mm -hmm. it's doing something. So if you have a big data set, it's going to take a lot of time. So you know, and then you go, okay, what's happened there? How is it? How is it aligned this this set? And it's kind of tricky to see. So if we look at this now, if you watch that, it looks stationary. If we compare it to um, the first one, and what color would you? Let's make that so it, they look the same so that's where you can choose whatever color you know it's like ooh magenta ooh red green hot ooh high low you know meaningless it was a black and white camera we're just applying a pseudo color on top of it um, and there's loads there and there's also loads in the lookup tables millions and millions you know choose your favorite colors okay whoop whoop and then you can compare that and it looks stationary yeah pretty good the way it does it is it has to crop your image slightly so if we um, let's do it if we move through here can you see here There should be data there, but it's m cropped it off. If I bring it in any closer here, oops. Let's make it black. You can, you can see it. So if you play them side by side, it's stationary because the crop box is kind of moving around, but it looks like it's stationary. But you'll have these black f edges to your data set. But it looks a lot better. If you've got something jumpy, it looks pretty good. Let's make them both black and white again. So another thing that you can do really easy in ImageJ is combine movies. You could play two movies side by side. Yeah, so this is something that people kind of use Adobe Premiere or, or a movie making package. What you need is your two files to be exactly the same type. Okay, 
So these are 8-bit images. Even though they've got a pseudo color on there, doesn't really matter. Um, so you can change the type if you need to modify them under the type. You can make them 8-bit, 8 8-bit 8 color, RGBs, all the things like that. So you can modify what kind of a file it is. So if we want to play these movies side by side, again, there's a plugin, Stacks Building, um, Stack Combiner. How would you like it? So Stack 1 was our wobbly one. Uh, stack 2 is Wobble 1 which is your aligned stack. Would you like them on top of each other or next door to each other? Okay, let's have them next door to each other. And now when you play it, whoops, I did it the other way around, didn't I? There's your movie, your wobbly one, played next to it. <laughs> so there, there you go. So, and it's a, so you kind of think, mm, there's no, no divider down the middle in this one. There's no. I've, I've not been able to find it. There probably is. If you go searching through the image J plugins, there'll be one where it says, would you like to make a nice little line down the middle plugin? The way I've done it is to kind of add my own. So if we draw the line down it, and you go, mm, let's draw a line down there. Make sure it's straight-ish. Mm, near enough. And... Um, image, no, edit, draw. Would you like that to go into all 40 images? Yes. There's my line now. Stamped through my stack. Yeah. So the other thing you can do under the, the plugins, um, T functions, where are you? There should be one where you add a time. Movies. Time stamper. Here you go. Starting time zero. What's your interval? Every 20 seconds. Where would you like it to go? So now when you're playing, you've got your time as you're playing along. Yeah. But this is kind of image J for movies, but you can also do it so that you measure a region of interest over time. So if you wanted to measure that, focal adhesions, um, intensity versus time monitor. So that shows you the intensity in just that region of interest over the time course of the experiment. You can, to prove it's working, you can go in and move that about so you can move your regions of interest. Yeah, so that's just working on a big ROI as you move along. If you wanted to, if you wanted to show that ROI over the time course, um, all you need to do is, again, draw. So you could say where your data was being analyzed through, through the time course. If you wanted to add, let's make that an RGB. suddenly much bigger file size because we've now not just got gray we've got blue green and red but what that means is we can then go in and start adding arrows and we can color the arrows because if it's a gray scale you can only have black and white if you have an arrow you can start adding arrows to what you want so uh, i kind of think ooh, that's a nice focal adhesion let's label that um Now, is there a, this is where some works better in um, low, what do you call it? I'll tell you what, let's save that movie. So file, save, save that, and we'll just save that as combined stack. Boom, all right, close all that. Let's go into Fiji, because I know where the button is. Um, at least I thought I did. Uh, I've lost me. Mm. 
one of these has it. Not that. Not that. Not that. There we are. Sorry, it was that all along. Boom. Here's our movie again. And that's where I want my arrow to go. So here is an arrow tool. So draw arrow. Um, there. Yeah? Drawing tool menu. What are you doing? Okay. There you go. So here's where you can choose what color arrow, what direction you'd like it to be in, how big you'd like it to be. Um, and then apply it, boom. So it's only there for that, that brief second, okay, because we only said show it for Z8 of, or time point eight of eight. If we did that again, let's, I wanna label that one this time. From slice, well, all the way from the beginning, all the way through to Z section 31 this time, yeah? Okay, but what, what, what one do I want this time? Well, I don't want that. I want a nice yellow one. Mm, pointing straight down. Yeah? Apply. So now when we play our movie... Pop. So you can have them come on and off at different points in the, in the sequence. So if you had something that moved quite a bit, it might be a bit of a pain, but you could kind of keep repositioning the arrow to, to show where, where it's moving to. Um, one thing for Leo, before I forget, for Leo, this makes everyone go, Whoa, fantastic. Um, if we open in Fiji while we're here, one of the samples, which is the fly brain, it's just a confocal stack, yeah, going up and down through a, through a fly brain. So you can do all of those things that we, we talked about before. But ImageJ also has the ability under the plugins, 3D viewer, to actually go in and render this um, volume. So you can play, play through it in 3D, you know, like turn it round, slice through it. Um, yeah. So you can zoom in, you can turn it round, you know, and that's just from that set. Okay, and what's good is you can actually record you doing that. Okay, so you can make a movie of you playing with your volume. You can see how bright this is. So this is the thing, good data in, you get lots of options to do lots of good things. Crap data, you're gonna struggle. You know, and you try doing a volume, it's gonna look all and pretty, pretty shocking. But what we can do here is we can start freehand recording, yeah? So I go in there and now and I can tell, mm, we have a wiggle, zoom in and out, turn it round, mm -hmm, do whatever you want. Um, stop animation, whoops, no, it's freehand recording, isn't it? Stop freehand recording. And all of a sudden, here I am, back in my happy image J window, where now, as I'm, that was my movie that I made, that I could then save off as an AVI and stick into my my lab talk to, to dazzle them with, with lab good um, presentations. The other thing that you can do in the, the volume viewer, so you need quite a good computer to do all this, yeah, because it's quite a lot of memory and RAM needed. But this is just looking at it like a volume. You can change the way you look at it. Um, which is display as ortho slice. So this might make more sense as to what we were looking at earlier, where you're looking at just very thin sections now. Yeah, do you see? 
where we're just looking at one, one slice cut through each way. And again, you can choose, they all move around, select, where are you? Where are you? View. Somewhere you can choose. The slices. Now, where are you? Hmm. Display, select. No. Somewhere there is a bar that you can choose which Z you're looking at, which other one. And I can't see where that is. Never mind. It's there somewhere. I sh if you want to do any of that, if you look around, eventually you will see um, the, the options. I just can't see it. Oh, fit to set the nah. Okay, it is there, so you can play through the different different Zs. Aha! Right click. I'm a Mac user. What on earth is there a right button for? I have no idea. But you ha if you right click when you're on the image, there they are. Somewhere they used to be in the actual menu, so they right click. And now, if you watch this, as we change this. You can see as we go th going through that section, going up and down through that section, you could even turn it off. Yeah, so you you don't have to have all of the volumes. So if anyone works on fly uh, flybrains, I should imagine we'll be seeing plenty of uh, similar things very very shortly. So yeah, the world of right click is all all in there. Um, okay, so. I'm trying to think, what, what time is it? 10 past 1. What else did people say? Oh, Co-localization, of course, yeah. So if we went back to MBF image J, you know, there is um, this huge section on co-localization analysis. So it's worth, you know, working your way, way through that. But these are a core component of certainly um, MBF image J and 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 also um, somewhere in here there will be co-localization as well. If I open up, it makes it kind of. There's two ways of doing. There's always loads of ways of doing stuff. Yeah. Let's have a look. Where's our? Here's an image of lots and lots of cells and you want to know how many of them are co-localized you know so some are green some are red and some are red and green making yellow so one thing is to sort of say oh okay well the way I would do it is count all of the cells <laughs> by hand and you've got little tools that you can download which is like as you click it'll make a mark you know so it'll It'll tell you what cells have already been counted rather than you kind of try to work your way along. Or you can try and use counting tools or you can try and use co-localization tools. Yeah. So this is a really good example because it's so obvious where you've got co-localization. Um, let's move that out of the way. So you need to split the channels up. If you're going to do co-localization, um, let me split it. So there's no blue in there. There's your green channel, and if you wanted to make that look green just to help you, and there's your red channel, let's just make it look red just to help us so we can kind of work out where we're going. So ooh, who knows? But under the plugins, there's co-localization analysis. So these are what are covered in that tutorial. But one of the you could do a co-localization highlighter. So this is quite nice. And what you're saying is Right, my channel red, channel one is red, my channel two is the green one. 
and the threshold intensity. So you kind of, every pixel on your image has a value somewhere between zero and saturation, 255 or 4095. So if you just said, ah, how many of my red pixels are also green? The answer is every single one of them. Probably everything's got a value higher than zero. So you've got to be careful that you've got to set a level. You can't just sort of say, how many of my pixels are, have got red and green components? Cause it could be everything. So you need to play with the thresholds to find out above what percentage of the pixels above that level will be, be considered. And there you go, straight off. There, now in white, are my pixels that are sufficiently green and sufficiently red to be counted as co-localized. So uh, somewhere there should have been numbers popped out with, with values. Okay. Now if we split this image up, you see there's a blue value because the white had a blue value to make it look white because it had to have the red, the green and the blue component. So that's your co-localized spots making it easier to see in, in that respect. Another way is, uh, and this is where, if you wanted to know how many cells in were in my image and how many of my cells had a value above something else, we could, I was thinking about this yesterday, and there's probably a really simple way. I found a really complicated way. So, <laughs> and this is the thing, who knows? You've got to just play. So what I would, the question I would ask is, okay, how many cells have I got there in total? And then, what are the values of my green cells? And what are the values of my red cells? And I want to know everything. And I want that to all go into Excel so I can do my data analysis at a later point. So the first thing I want to do is count how many cells are there. So there we go. With our one, two, three. Or we can use a plugin to count the cells for us. Right? But that only works, unfortunately, in um, a grayscale 8-bit image. So let's first of all duplicate this image. There we go. Exactly the same. But now I'm going to make it an 8-bit. So it was red, green, blue. I'm just going to make it 8-bit. So everything that had a color now is just white. And we're going to set a threshold. So this is where we choose what pixels we want to use. So everything has a value. And then we can do that. If I say, how many of my pixels have a value between 0 and 255? The answer is every single one of them. Yeah. So we can say, well, what pixel intensities do I want to work with? So if I start to bring this up and say, no, my pixels that I want to use must have a value between 70 and 255. If you've got some red hot pixels that you just want to dis discount, you can bring that in to reject them as well. OK. So what we're wanting to do is pretty much get all of our nuclei to be selected. Yeah. Don't apply that. And what we're going to do then is we're going to do some analysis on these. So we can set the measurements. What do you want to know? The area, the min max gray value, the mean gray value, um, limit to threshold. So it's only going to count the cells that I want because I've, I've already decided my le threshold levels. Um, you know, you can have shapes, all sorts. Do you want to know the area fraction? You might be interested to know how what, what percentage of your, your field of view is, is um, stained. OK. And then we go to Analyze, Analyze Particles. And Add to Manager is really useful. This is kind of your, your analysis measuring package tool. So we want to display the results. Summarize, give us a little nice box. Exclude on edges, probably important. And what do you want to show? Nothing. So you just get the result. Or you can say, show me the outlines of what you've counted as, a, as an event. So I, I like to do that. And what size should it have? So you can see here, we've got like single pixels almost. You know, you're going to have, you don't want to analyze that. That's just debris and crap. Likewise, you might not want some monster cells. 
So you, you might say, well, it's got to have a value between 10 pixels up to 1,000, which I've hopefully nothing is that big. Um, OK, there's my, there's my list of ROIs. So it's showing me uh, this display, if we zoom in on that. Every single one of these has a value. That corresponds to this value here. Yeah, so we know now every single region of interest, and we get from it its area, the mean intensity, the min max gray values for that. Okay, and that's counted, as you can see there, every single one of these events on my screen. Here's our ROI manager. If you turn off the edit mode, because the edit mode shows you the label, turn that off, and there's my you can see every single one of my nuclei has been counted. If I go back to that and just reset that, there you go. You can see all of the nuclei have been selected. So that is my total number of cells in that field of view. If we go back to our red, green, blue, and we split that, get rid of that. So here's my green channel. If I go to my ROI manager, I can paste those regions of interest that I made in my combined uh, all cells field and superimpose it then on just my green. And you can see this, these, they were nuclei, but now they're just holes. But when I do the analysis, it will still count them and measure the intensities inside that region of interest, which would obviously come out at like zero. I can then go to my red channel and do the same thing. Um, where are you? There we go again. You can see it's highlighted all of the cells. And all we need to do is say measure. And it will add to our, somewhere, wherever it is, our, um, our results table. Not you. You can see it gets a bit messy. There you go. So they all start to get labelled each time you press the um, measure tool. Save all them. Now, if you press uh, all of them, measure. Boom. So it tells you for every one of those, that's your value in your green channel. If you went to your red channel, measure again, <laughs> you've got them all in red channel. So you can then put in that into Excel and look at the red and green intensities on a region by region basis. And you know it's the same region. Yeah? So that's, that's kind of the um, one way of doing counting of cells and like expression levels, not just how, however many cells are there. Um, what else was I going to do? Let's have a look. Oh, yeah. Tracking particles. Blimey. Not sure about that. Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look at this one. Okay. Mm -hmm -hmm. Something like that. Tracking those particles there, yeah? Okay. So, let's see. Let's stop that. I'm going to do that through Fiji. So we need to threshold, for, first of all, to decide what it is we want to count. So again, dark background, what, what, what do I want to use? Well, those, all those cells. 
Um, and then there's plugins, which is, there's tracking modules here. So this is it. There's manual tracking. Um, this is where it's kind of tedious, and this is the one that probably most people use, which is add a track. There you go. There's every time I click. It adds, adds it, so we end that track. So if I show, um, <laughs> so every, as I'm moving along, it's going to show me where I've been. But that's going to take you a long time, you know. Um, so that's the manual. That's the. But what's quite good is that every time you click, it'll progress the frame by one. So you you know you're moving in the right direction. So you just have to chase the the focal adhesion or whatever. And every click you make, it records it. So you get from it the distance it's moved. And if you've got it all calibrated, it'll give you the velocities and the you know the the vector maps and things like that. Um, there's then under the tracking. There's um, is it this one? No. There's another one which is quite nice because it shows you what it's doing as it's doing it. Here we go. So if you go back to the beginning here, so it's a similar idea. Add. So you can see where you're going as you're doing it. Yeah. Add another. Oops. So you can kind of follow it all that way. And you, again, as you measure, it's going to give you all of the outputs for each of the images. And as you play it, you can see where, they, where they're going. Or you could have it as like dragon's tails and things like that. So you can it'll only show you a certain number of points as it's moving. They're all, they're all possible. Uh, no. But there's also an automatic way of doing it. If your data's good. Because your data is all dependent on you being able to threshold these things. Yeah? So if your background isn't that different to your signal, it's going to be really hard to select the signal. Um, so adjust the threshold. And I think we need to make that binary. So we need to apply that when we're happy with it. Um, apply background. Now we have basically just a, map, a, a binary map of our focal adhesions. We've lost that data, you know, the, the actual pixel values, but we've got, it's much easier for it to track what's, what's going on. And under the plugins, um, tracking, mm, no, it's not that, is it? No. I think it is. Yeah, OK. The smallest object size, well, we don't want these tiny dots again. So say it's got to have a value of 5. Biggest one, well, that's like infinity. So say um, 1,000. How fast are you expecting it to move? Let's call it 2. How many frames must it be present in to be counted as an event? So this is your way of getting rid of noise again. So say it's got to be there in 5 images. Display. Show us, show, yeah, what, what, who, who knows? Everything. I can't have too much. Save it to desktop. Blah, 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 blah. And here we go. So that's showing you your actual paths that each one um, selected. And that's the, you can't, you probably can't see it, but each one of those. <coughs> has a number which corresponds to a measurement which <coughs> if you look in that there you go so for each one of those regions of interest through that movie you have all of the data about <coughs> its its size and its movement its its velocity is all all kind of um, labeled and that's kind of the the lengths of each you might be able to change that. So you can have different colours. Woohoo! Yeah. But yeah, the I think what I needed to do was when I did the thresholding, I should have made the four the the values black and the background white. So you'd have been able to see the 
the labels because you can see just as they're moving in, if you zoom in far enough, rather conveniently, the um, the labels, I think that's number nine. I think the labels are in black, so you can't see it. Um, yeah, the, what else can I, anything else? Or is everyone now starving? I know everyone's starving. I'm kind of, my stomach hasn't rumbled exactly, but it's only a matter of time. Um, so this tool allows you to change colors. So if we wanted to add text, uh, not, not on that one. Why is that not there? We should be able to add it. I have no idea. You should be able to add text. Again, odd. Let's close that. Uh, Open 